Um, so our next speaker is uh, Bernardo de Gama, um, and he's going to be talking about biomimetics from seaweed use for antifouling applications. To control my own time so that I don't take too much of it. Um, Shifted. Okay. So, good afternoon to all. It's already afternoon. Um, I would like to speak about uh, antifouling solutions from seaweed biomimetics. So, this is, of course, a work, an ongoing work. This is the result of not only my work, but the work of my colleagues as well. So, uh, and this, this is the work of uh, the result of more than 20 years of research. So, I would like to, to highlight that. So we have a problem. I'm not going to develop into that problem because I have been hearing about this problem since yesterday, um, which is marine biofouling. So it affects not only navigation, but all human-made affairs in the sea. So including, of course, uh, clean energy generation now and in the future. So also, of course, fouling ships uh, transport exotic species. So um, of course, in new places, they may become invaders, for example. And uh, past and present solutions involve a biocide approach. Everybody talks about biocides, biocides, marine pests. So we have been doing that since 2,500 years ago when the Phoenicians started using copper, as uh, copper sheets in their, in their ships to navigate. So we have always used the same approach, biocide, biocide, killing, killing, killing. And uh, nature doesn't work like that. So uh, what I'm proposing, and I could even have changed the title of my lecture, for from biocides to biomimetics instead of the name I gave. So um, of course, today, TBT is banned, and copper came back. Copper is under regulation, under st scrutiny, as has been said. Uh, in some countries, it has already been uh, re restricted with antifouling paints, and it should follow in many countries as copper will accumulate um, in sediments, for example, in other organisms can come back for us, uh, can accumulate in, in seafood, for example. So, and of course there is a whole plethora of other boosted biocides that are now used instead of TBT and together with copper, and they will follow, many of them are already following, that there is increasing evidence of side effects, of undesirable effects to other marine life, of accumulation, in sediments, for example. So what is biomimetics? Let's, let's uh, first look into that. Biomimetics is the imitation of the models, the systems, and the elements of nature uh, with the purpose of solving complex human problems. And uh, marine life has always been a source of inspiration since always. If you look into an airplane, it is, of course, uh, it maybe has, it's not bio-inspired, but it converged to the, to the body of a shark. It looks very much like uh, the body of a shark and for obvious reasons. Um, so nowadays we even use shark skins, 3, 3D printing as has been pointed out to imitate the uh, uh, character features of uh, uh, marine life. And uh, of course actually this kind of uh, thing doesn't work because you cannot just move like a shark. Our bodies doesn't, don't have this uh, ability to move like that. Well, um, so the designing of uh, biomimetic antifouling surfaces was not, of course, my idea or the idea of my own group. It has been published, it has been suggested, and it's an idea that is popping up in many other places as well. Um, and uh, this, this human swimmer you cannot see, but this human swimmer has a bird, okay? So, <laughs> Usually, when you see this kind of graph, you, I'm not going into that. It has been fairly explained by people that know much more of physics than me. I'm a marine biologist. But basically, when you look into that, you don't see seaweeds. You don't see macroalgae there. Why? Because they don't move. They live attached. So how do they have to cope with fouling? Why, why are you, why am I investigating marine algae? So that's what I'm going to explain. Marine algae, of course, live attached, so they are sessile organisms. They live attached to rocks, attached to hulls, attached everywhere. 
and uh, they face the same problems that the, that biofouling, or in that case, they would call we would call epibiosis, which is the growth of one organism on top of each other. Um, so they are also the best chemists in the sea. They cannot run away from fouling, so they have to stand it. And they have, uh, you know, they have emerged at 2.8 billion years, according to the more recent estimates. So they deal with the biofouling problem for m much, much longer time than we will ever deal with it. So they, of course, had to come with natural mechanisms to deal with uh, epibiosis or biofouling. So they have been selected for antifouling defenses over a very long evolutionary time scale. And uh, of course, algae don't have fruits, they don't have flowers, they don't have roots. They make everything based on their single talus. They make everything, they reproduce releasing um, gametes or spores from the talus. They, they need to keep the surface clean because they, they make photosynthesis, so they, they need to receive light. Anything that uh, 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 reduces light it will uh, decrease the life expectancy and the life fitness of a, of a seaweed. Um, so, soon after appearing, of course, larvae, um, algae became fouled themselves. They became overgrown with organisms. And, uh, of course, they have to deal in those cases they, a single larva that successfully settles on a, on a uh, seaweed is enough to then overgrow the whole alga. Why? Because a single larva will then, in some cases, and some phyla, they will just grow, uh, reproduce asexually, and cover the entire surface. So they have to deal, they have to inhibit or repel a single larva from settling on them. Otherwise, they will lose efficiency. Um, of course, later when we appeared in this scenario, algae also became biofouling. Say they also became fouling. So they also settled in our man-made structures. So uh, seaweeds have different strategies to cope with biofouling. Uh, since epitalus slogan or the release of the fouled surface, the fouled uh, top layer of the algae, this is common in calcareous algae, um, they release, of course, chemicals. They have oxidative bursts, explosions of uh, uh, reactive species of oxygen, for example. Um, they have coral sensing, they have bacteria, they sometimes grow bacteria. It's not surprising that some, um, some effective antifouling coatings actually have biofilms on them. They have some slime. Because, of course, the bacteria themselves, they can produce chemicals. They can release chemicals that signal to other bacteria to aggregate or to not aggregate. So there is a chemical communication between algae and their uh, microscopic epibionts. Um, and also, different types of algae, brown algae, red algae, green algae, they have structures that release, produce, store, and release chemicals. Especially red algae, we know very well. Uh, well, not so very well, but uh, we know that in Lorenzi species, which is a red alga, there is a special uh, cherry body or, or corpse and cities that retain the halogenated compounds. Why? They are in special uh, uh, structures because they can be toxic to the producing organism as well. So there is a traffic of these structures to the cell surface where they actually act. And in some species, only the top layer has these structures. And in brown algae, you have physodes that keep, uh, that store um, polyphenolic compounds that also are polymers, natural polymers, that work as antifolants as well. Um, and uh, in other algae, we have gland cells and uh, mevalonosomes in plocamium, for example. Um, that also keep uh, interesting chemicals. And of course, finally, you have microtopography, you have, which has also been talked about. So microtopography is also something that algae and other marine life use. It's one of the many defense systems of marine algae against biofouling, this which has been just recently studied. Well, I'm not gonna take long in that, but basically uh, we have done, we use usually the ability of muscles uh, to reattach, to test uh, first antifouling, to screen for antifouling compounds in the lab, and then we test them in the field under more realistic, under more realistic, sorry, under more realistic uh, conditions, um, and under a, a more natural supply of different organisms. We also have done some tests with antifouling uh, coatings, 
Uh, this is a test of uh, TBT paint, the white one, and one, well, no, the, the white one is a, is a, a TBT-based matrix of paint, and on the side of it, you see the other white lane, which is actually uh, TBT paint, which you see there is some slime on it. Um, this was a test done many years ago, and um, well, so far we have screened algae from all over the Brazilian coast, part of Antarctica, part of the Chilean coast as well, and some algae also from Central America. I'm not going to show all the results, but only the results um, until the last decade. Um, so the red algae, as you can see, the red algae are the best producer of, of antifouling compounds, probably because red algae, they have the unique ability to halogenate compounds, so they can put chlorine and bromine in the same structure, especially. And this is very rich in terms of bioactivities and many of the pharm pharmacological activities, cosmetic activities, so red algae are a common target for bioprospection because they produce unique compounds with a, a very much, uh, very interesting uh, biological activities, including antifouling compounds. So among all the divisions, red, brown, and green, the red are by far the best producers. Brown algae, some of them are really effective uh, in terms of uh, the chemicals they produce, some of them actually do the opposite. Nature is funny. Some of them actually stimulate or tolerate fouling, and some really stimulate fouling. So we, we have been studying one of these uh, biofouling stimulating compounds because they can be useful in aquaculture, for example, to stimulate the settlement of the desired organisms, for example, muscle settlement in specific, in cultures, for example. Or you can put it, give it to the Navy and give it to paint the, your enemy's ships, for example. <laughs> And finally, green algae. Green algae are very interesting. People have been investigating antifolants from green algae even here in Australia, and nobody has found anything. They have a very interesting chemical ecology, but nobody found anything. I am puzzled by this. People everywhere are puzzled about this. So what green algae have? And green algae live in tropical waters, in shallow waters, where the fouling pressure is maximal. So what is happening? What is going on with green algae? So what we suggest, well, this is just a proportion of uh, strong, moderate, and uh, inactive compounds from the different divisions of algae. So you see that uh, red algae are actually the best producers. And um, again, uh, we try to find a uh, um, latitudinal pattern because there is this trend in diversity, everybody says that tropical uh, organisms are better defended there than their temperate counterparts. But when you look into antifouling compounds, all tested with the same methodology, with the same number of replicates, we don't see any latitudinal pattern. There is no trend like that. Uh, the, the trend that we find is phylogenetic. Um, so this is one of the cases. This is El Atoll from, from one species of Lorentia, actual. Actually, many different species of Lorentia produce the same compound. And as I said, it's a wonderful antifouling compound, and it has chlorine and bromine in the same small compound. So it's a very interesting template to, of course, obtain by synthesis or by other methods uh, similar compounds and test them as antifouling compounds. Um, other compounds also from brown algae we have been studied, studying, but we don't have any synthetic analogs of them. Um, well, so what green algae have? So I have been tempted to believe that they have something else that is not a natural product. It's not a small compound. Probably it's a polymer. It's not a uh, peptide, not a protein, probably a polysaccharide. Algae are known to produce synthetic polysac uh, sulfated polysaccharides. So I'm now looking into the sulfated polysaccharides, and I have come with this idea, which I was tempted to call the banana peel hypothesis, but maybe does, that wasn't so professional, so I called it coefficient of friction hypothesis. So seaweeds are known to have uh, um, very small coefficients of friction. The coefficient of friction usually goes from zero to one, and um, they, some of them, which have been studied, have very low, nearly zero of a friction, uh, friction coefficient. So um, have rough surfaces, of course, everybody knows that. They have higher coefficients of friction. And uh, so possibly 
uh, sulfated polysaccharides are responsible for reducing the, the coefficient the coefficient of friction of uh, seaweeds. We still don't know. We are going to start this in 2020, uh, if we can still can get money from the Brazilian government. Um, but uh, what is interesting about it is that, as it has been pointed out yesterday, for example, in the case of uh, invasive Hundaria, you can extract, even from invasive algae, the polysaccharides. There are companies that, that sell these, these compounds, so it's, they are readily available, a lot of different compounds from different divisions of, of algae. They are available commercially from Sigma, from Merck, and different other, other different chemical co companies. And what we want to do is to integrate these polysaccharides with seaweed natural products and test then combined mechanisms. Uh, so you have this different collection, the effectiveness of the extraction of polysaccharides from algae is very high, unlike that of natural products, which usually are very low in concentration. So polysaccharides can be up to 40% uh, of the dry biomass of, of a seaweed. So they are readily extractable, easily extractable. And um, of course, there is already also uh, synthetic sulfated polysaccharides. So it's, the mechanisms are already very well known. So. Um, what I would like to tell you as well is that in terms of microtopography, which was the last mechanism, there is already people studying that. Claire Elio, which was supposed to come, but uh, she couldn't make it. She's, uh, she has done some study with other collaborators uh, reproducing the microtopography of seaweeds. This is just starting, but it's also uh, an interesting uh, and promising mechanism. Uh, of course, I have also done that with a uh, muscle microtopography together with uh, Andrew Scardino, which is from Australia as well, and is in this meeting. I'm not seeing him, but he's around. Oh, okay. So we have done some studies, not with uh, seaweeds, but with uh, mussels, and of course, in places like Brazilian uh, bays, like Guanabara Bay, which is heavily polluted, microtopography doesn't work. So it doesn't work alone, but it can work together with other mechanisms. So. What we expect to do in the future is, is combine more than one mechanism because it seems like seaweeds actually combine different mechanisms. Physical mechanisms like reducing uh, the coefficient friction, of friction and using also chemicals, uh, you know, natural compounds. And these natural compounds, this is important to highlight, they, they do not necessarily kill marine organisms. They can work like just repelling the larvae. The larvae can just move somewhere else. In the past, we believed that larvae just settled like a particle of sediment in the, in the bottom and then metamorphosed into a juvenile. That, that is not how it happens. Now we know that actually even seaweeds, they settle actively, they select the substratum, they can swim away from an undesirable substratum. So actually, um, we are looking forward to make non-toxic biodegradable chemicals uh, in coatings with uh, interactive surface properties. Um, for example, uh, self-polishing coatings, are, they are already biomimetic in the sense that they already, they have of course biocides associated, but they also, you know, because they are self-polishing, it's also a physical mechanism. So we are again um, following nature's examples. And uh, microencapsulation, for example, has been attempted and has been done in, in research studies and marine algae do that. They also microencapsulate in special vesicles to natural compounds. Um, and uh, we have been also doing in Brazil some research with a new class, uh, almost unknown class of uh, marine algae compounds, which are um, glycolipids. And um, it seems like they show promising antifouling activity. They are better known in fungi, but they also occur in marine algae. So uh, we want, we expect, of course, this is a lot of basic research. So we expect to cast some light upon the mechanisms underlying antifouling defense in seaweeds. Uh, we are also organizing a very large matrix with uh, all the environmental data of the sampling sites from which we have extracted these uh, seaweeds. Um, and we will combine this with the composition of the seaweeds, the known composition, the known bioactivities, and try to figure out with, if there are other global patterns in the producer, production of antifouling compounds. Um, 
And of course, we want to provide the basis for new biomimetic coatings, um, with not necessarily from marine origin, but, but with marine inspiration. And um, we expect to the next year, if we can keep some funding, to have already this combined biotech approach tested in, in under laboratory and field conditions. So uh, commercially available, finally, commercially available macroalgal products may lead to very fast uh, shelf availability of new bio-inspired um, antifouling solutions. Well, finally, I would like to thank um, our Brazilian government uh, national uh, Science Foundation for financing my studies so far, and uh, to all our amazing uh, partnerships that we have, uh, with, including with Ricardo, who is, here, who is here, and to John Alonso for inviting me for this amazing conference, and Violeta for organizing everything for my trip here. So thank you very much.